today's episode, we're going to talk about what it takes to be an entrepreneur or things I guess you could do to be an entrepreneur. Enjoy. Welcome to the Age of Jeremy. My name is Jeremy Quintanilla. I'm the founder and CEO of Q Consolidated Limited. We focus on investing and creating businesses in media and entertainment, finance, investing, and insurance, education and e-learning, art, music, and the humanities, earth and human sustainability and advancement, and earth and space exploration and transportation. Our current businesses include 3 Two Warrior Academy, Q Financial, Age of Radio, and Merlin, just to name a few. You can find me on all social medias at Age of Jeremy, except on X, it is at Age of Jeremy Q. And on Facebook, for some reason, it's Cesar Jeremy Quintanilla. There are links in the episode description down below. And also make sure to subscribe to our my or our my amazing YouTube channel at Age of Jeremy. If you're new to this podcast, this is about all the learnings that I go through to build my business empire. And I hope you pick up some wisdom along the way. I also have guests that share their trials and tribulations, becoming content creators, and the adventures they have gone through to become entrepreneurs or the adventures they are going through becoming entrepreneurs or the adventures they are going through as entrepreneurs. If you want to see Coach JV's financial blueprint, there is my link tree in the episode description and you can get Coach JV's financial blueprint. It's the Warrior's Guide to Financial Freedom. Absolutely free. Please join my Q Consolidated channel and my Age of Jeremy Instagram account. You can find it in the Instagram profile. I provide extra insight on the things I've gone on in my business and in my life. Hopefully you will find some wisdom in it. It's free to join. Also make sure to check out ageofradio.com to see all of our amazing podcasts. We will be adding more soon. You can also join our amazing community of content consumers and content creators at our Addicted to Podcasting Facebook group. All our welcome. All right. To get on with this shindig. Let's start off with some news. This is from Bloomberg's. I found this very, very interesting. I found it very, I don't know. I don't know if I found it. I found it interesting. I don't know if you'll find it interesting, but I'm going to read it to you anyways. Um, if I can find it on my computer as it was somewhere so I could read it to you. And here it is. And also, we are not sponsored by Bloomberg's, but I recommend you read as much as possible. I was reading a fantastic, fantastic book um, called The Ten, Ten Faces of Innovation, I think it is. And essentially, it's by the IDEO group, IDEO. I think it's called the IDEO group. It's the 10 Faces of Innovation. And essentially, inside of it, they're talking about like the 10 types of character, I don't want to say characteristics, but profiles that you should have inside of your business or that we all have as we um, do innovation. And one of them is the anthropologist. And that's the first one goes as far as I've gone in the book so far is through the anthropologist. And in the anthropologist um, profile, they talk about like, well, if you're not able to go out in the field to observe, or if you need to find new things and to get a sense of what's happening, I guess would be the best, the way that I understood it. Magazines do wonders and we have so much access to so much amazing information now. So I recommend that you find some cool creative magazines um, to take part in like dwell. I'm part of the art um, magazine uh, or art newspaper. I'm sorry, the art newspaper. I get it once a month. It's fantastic. It keeps me up to date on art. It opens my mind to new things. Um, um, they used examples like Dwell, um, Architectural Digest. I don't know. There's a bunch of graphic design magazines that are probably out in the world. Um, but you should also stay up to date on some business stuff. And I'm a big fan of Bloomberg's. Um, again, we're not sponsored by Bloomberg, but I use Bloomberg because I like the layout. It's easy to find. And I try to stay pretty consistent with the stuff that I'm looking at it. A lot of the stuff that I'm getting from here is from our wealth. There's not a lot of new tax stuff. So I found this amazing uh, document called Every Generation Makes Money mistakes. Here's what they are. It's by Claire Ballantyne and Charlie Wells. This was released October 4th on Bloomberg's. Um, 
With money as with life, timing is everything. The trouble is many of us are making moves in the wrong decade. We hear about the dangers of debt when we're young, but pay off the wrong loans first. We know to ramp up savings for retirement, but take on the wrong sort of risk. And when we discover the plans we made in our youth no longer make sense, we plow forward anyway. Financial advisors say these kinds of timing missteps are increasingly common with each generation moving into a new phase of life. The older half of Gen Z is entering the workforce. Millennials are growing their families and wealth. That's me, millennials. Go, millennials. Gen Xers at their peak earning years are becoming the new sandwich generation. I don't know what that means, but sandwiches are delicious. And the last of the baby boomers are heading into retirement. Meanwhile, interest rates are higher than they have been in years. The job market is cooling, and the jury is still out on whether the U.S. can avoid a recession. The problem with assumptions and rules of thumb is that their construction is based on the environment at the time, said Mark Struthers, a financial planner in Sona Wealth. In our current environment, we're living longer in college, health care, and housing costs are increasing faster than the wages to support them. What are those old assumptions? How can you make sure you're adapting, adapting, adapting? adapting them for your stage of life. Below are the adages financial advisors say each generation should be wary of adopting. So essentially in this article, they're talking about um, things that each generation should be wary of. And so let's talk about Gen Z. So Gen Zers um, are uh, the children of the Gen Xers for the most part. Um, so in Gen Z, they're the labor mar- labor's market. They're like in their 18s, 20s, like my niece is a Gen Zer. There is this group that's between Gen Z and millennial that's not fully a millennial, not fully a Gen Z, and we call them Zennials. That's um like with their age of radio. A Zennial perfect example would be Ruthie. She helps solve with her accounts payable. Um, Ruthie would be a Zennial by that age range, like 27, 28. Now, Gen Z, the labor market's news crop of workers is here, having grown up during the Great Recession. Older Gen Zers are known to prior to prioritize saving and investing at an earlier age compared to older generations, but many are starting off with a lot more student debt, even compared to millennials. I don't know how that's possible because I have so much student debt. And to be honest with you, I will keep getting student debt to learn more and more things because knowledge is the most powerful thing that we can. But the good news is I make good amount of money and I'm a businessy person, an entrepreneur. I do stuff that brings me wealth and money just flows to me. So I hope the money flows to you. I'm so happy and grateful with the money that comes to me in increasing quantity, increasing quantity, increase. I'm so happy and grateful for the money that comes to me from with I'm so happy. How's it go? I'm so happy and grateful for the money that comes to me in increasing quantities man, it's going to drive me crazy. I quote it all the time. And now that I'm quoting it on freaking air, I can't remember it for the life of me. Me and increasing quantities. Okay, hold on. I'm going to find it. Money comes to me in increasing quantities is a positive that is meant to attract. Well, well, that doesn't help me. Money comes to me in increasing quantities from multiple sources on a continuous basis. There we go. Uh, let's see. Hold on. This is, let me see if I can find the actual, uh, I am so happy and grateful. Here we go. I'm going to read this. I'm so happy and grateful now for the, I'm so happy. I'm so happy and grateful now that the money comes to me in increasing quantities through multiple sources continuously, but there's a better one. Hold on. It's Bob Proctor. We'll find it, folks. We'll find it. Money comes to money affirmation. I've been saying it for years. Sometimes I feel like I say it more than the Nambutsu, but actually I've been moving more towards saying the Nambutsu more. That's probably why I've forgotten this because the Nambutsu, Nambutsu will do the same thing and it will enlighten you so we can do amazing things with our wealth like build amazing things for Buddhism, give money back to the research of Buddhism, to the universities of Buddhism, to build stupas. Um, But I, this is something that I learned from John who learned it from Broad Proctor. Um, uh, And then, but like no one's actually freaking, this is what the problem is with the internet. It's all on video. And if I play it, I'm not going to hear it because I'm using the port for my audio. Let's see here. Um, oh, here we go. Okay. I am so happy and grateful now that money comes to me in increasing quantities on a consistent basis. 
I mean, that's really what it is. It's a fantastic money affirmation that Bob Proctor has. Say it as many times as you can. Use it like a mantra and money will eventually flow with you. Take that money, give back, grow your community, grow your family, give that money back, and then that money will recycle itself um, back to you. I don't know how it works, but it, well, I mean, I kind of know how it works because it's how affirmations and manifestation works and you're creating it above and so below. It's technically magic, but we'll call it manifestation. For right now, because people tend to like using that word more. But back to the Gen Zers. So Gen Zers, the labor's Marcus News crop of workers, they are here and they have more student debt than millennials. The assumption that they have is that all debt is bad. And that is half true and kind of true and somewhat wrong. Yes, paying off debt is a sound strategy in the broadest sense, but tackling debt too aggressively can have unexpected downsides. The trouble focusing too much on eliminating cheap debt can prevent borrowers from building an emergency fund or achieving other milestones. It is almost always a good idea to pay down debts with higher interest rates, such as those from credit cards. But a lot of student loans have the sort of low interest rates that are hard to come by now and servicing them at a slower pace could help a borrower focus on other goals. That's kind of like my mentality of it, I suppose. Um, the fix is uh, get wanting to get rid of debt, but there's a balance we want to strike, says Douglas Bonaparte of Bonafide Wealth. Get it? Bonaparte of Bonafide Wealth. This is in his last name. He recommends tackling debts with an interest rate above 7%, but stress the importance of having several months of cash reserves. I'm all about cash reserves. However, I'm more about liquidity, and I'm also more about investing in yourself to grow businesses. The greatest amounts of wealth are going to come from the greatest solutions that you solve inside of the world. So if you want to have massive amounts of wealth, you have to solve really, really important problems or you have to innovate new things. And that is how wealth is created. Um, so let's see here. I don't, is this another assumption of what they know? Did we switch? Did we switch to older people or is this still Gen Z? Oh, this is another Gen Z one. I should invest in what I know. That's the assumption. Buying shares of companies you understand sounds like a good idea, but Karen Ogden, a partner in Invest Asset Management, it sounds like they really interviewed a lot of people for this, this news article. Um, but Karen Ogan, a partner at Invest Asset Management, thinks Gen Z investors may need to reconsider the infamous Peter Lynch line, invest in what you know. I actually completely disagree with that. Only invest in what you know and only invest in what you care about. Um, but let's see what they have to say. The trouble, Gen Z knows a lot, maybe too much about tech, Apple, Alphabet, Microsoft, and Amazon.com Inc. I think that that's simplifying it. I think that the youth know a lot more than that. If we could get them to read more books. Some of them read books, but the ones that I know need to read more books have been around longer. Um, so Amazon, Microsoft, Alphabet have been around longer than many of them have even been alive, but these firms might not always be, or at least they might not always be star performers. I mean, I can't see all four of them not always being star performers and it's because of their leadership and their gr grooming sounds like a bad word and their grooming of new leadership, not other types of grooming. All right. So the fix that, sh that this Karen Ogden and me said, no, is this Karen? Yeah. Karen Ogden says the fix understand that a growth company like a tech company is going to be adversely affected with interest rates go up said Ogden. She advises against buying individual stocks and said like stocks are more diversified exchange traded funds. Now, I'm not disagreeing that you should, could look at exchange traded funds, and I use exchange traded funds for all kinds of things. Right now, I'm looking at getting more invested in Japan. In fact, I need to go throw a bunch of money in Japan. Right now, I've been putting money in Japan on a regular basis, and I really want to buy some Japanese bonds. I also am really getting fascinated with Denmark, and I want to put some money in their stock into their economy as well, into their Copen. I think it's the Copenhagen Exchange. I need to go do some more research, but buying Japanese bonds, if you want to diversify yourself in sectors, ETFs are amazing. Um, so I'm not totally against that, but I think it's good to get some of these Gen Zers to buy single stocks of companies that they own. They can get the, they can get the, um, oh man, I am not remembering shit tonight. It's probably because it's late when I'm recording this. Um, but, um, they can get the proxy statements, um, and then they can do the voting. And I think that that's good for them to know how it, how it works and how to understand it. And I don't, and, and when you're diversified in exchange traded fund, I don't, not a hundred percent. You probably don't get to do that. And so because of that, at least they should have some stocks. Okay. The assumption labor market. This is another assumption for Gen Zers. Is this only about Gen Zers? The hell was the name of this article? Every generation make money mistake. Here's what they are. I am still on. Oh, here's millennials. Okay. Let's jump from millennials. Gen Zers. They're, I don't know. They need to buy regular, not buy regular stocks, invest stocks, diversify stocks, I guess would be the right word to say. 
All right, millennials, they're getting older and hitting a lot of those delayed milestones, such as marriage, home ownership, and children. I'm a millennial. You might be a millennial too, but higher costs of education, housing, and healthcare are making it harder to save. All right, one assumption from them the risks are best avoided. I researchers have long known a millennial's risk aversion in life. I mean, I guess maybe that's why I'm successful because fuck, I love taking risks. That's the fun in life. At least business risks anyways, because again, you have to take risks to be wealthy. The trouble skipping out on risk also means skipping out on reward. During last year's stock route, millennials were more likely than other generations to ditch the market. That meant they missed a market rally too. The fix I see it as a literacy aspect, says Paulson of Valkyrie Financial. These fucking financial companies need to come up with some, I don't know, less aggressive names. She sees a lot of, except for the Bonaparte guy, she sees a lot of millennials attracted to 401ks that they say they have stable return options but are effectively cash, which won't bring the returns they will need to fund their retirements. When it's explained, people say, I can't. I can be a lot more aggressive than that, she said. For millennials who might be risk averse, she recommends target date portfolios that adjust their investment compositions as clients age. Yeah, yeah, those are boring as fuck too. All right, the assumption financial independence is key. Many millennials came of marriage age with fierce independent streaks. That's great, but advisors worry about couples who don't manage their portfolios together. The trouble partners with split portfolios may be missing out on yield on one hand or taking too much risk on the other. What I didn't see are two people that are too conservative said Ogden of invest asset, invest asset management is important to honor what your comfort is with risk. But if you are conservative and your spouse is conservative and you are young, you need to figure out a way to get some of those assets more aggressively invested. The fix Ogden recommends couples check in on their combined portfolios annually to make sure they don't have any blind spots. I would say fucking quarterly, but whatever. All right. Keep up to date on overall performance and make sure they aren't either too risky or too conservative, conservatively invested. Um, the assumption I should have my parents lifestyle by now, man, you should be over your parents lifestyle. No, I'm just kidding. i I feel for a lot of people and it's rough out there. Um, let's skip that one. Gen X, my least favorite generation. I know that sounds bad. So if you're a Gen Xer, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, I'm just kidding. I love all people. All right. A lot of today's mid 40 and 50 somethings are moving into the role of the sandwich generation. I don't know what that means. Is it because, is it because they're sandwiched between the millennials and, um, the baby boomers? Oh, no, it says right here. It says what it is right here. A lot of today's mid 40 and 50 somethings are moving into the role of the sandwich generation because they are stuck between twin pressures, caring for children, but also aging parents. That makes sense. Um, that's what my I mean, my mom. I mean, I guess my that's what my mom is kind of dealing with. She doesn't really take care of me. Um, and I, I'm going to 100 percent, thousand percent take care of her. Um, so I guess I'm, no, she's not in the place where she's that kind of taken care of. All right. So the assumption, they will pay for college like I did. No, I'm also not a gen anyway, not important. Okay. They'll pay for college like I did. It's one of the biggest, most out of date assumptions for others here as an advisor at Sunwell. Gen X parent paid her way through college. So she expects her child to do the same. That's the problem. That's my main problem that I have with gen Xers is that they think because they did something that other people should also be doing that thing. The biggest one, um, now my mom's a baby boomer, but the biggest one that I hear from my mom, even from sometimes from my amazing wife, Danielle, is that you shouldn't pay for your kid's car. They should have to work for it. And yeah, they need to work for it and they need to gain grit and they need to learn other types of things too. But at the same time, if you're able to help them out, my idea is to help them out and then also make them do other stuff for you to make them grind for the stuff that you are helping them with. And so like, for instance, we pay for our niece's college, which I am very happy to do, but in return, she's got to do good stuff in the world. She's got to get good grades. She's got to help clean the house. She's got to grind stuff out. She has to have a part-time job. This stuff doesn't have to be easy just because you're helping them with something, right? I would rather her have really, really rough days and nights, be able to get her college degree, not have a shit ton of debt, and then go off and make something in the world and do some great things in the world. And that is way more important than because I had to do something that other had people do it. If we all lived in the world, if if we all, in my opinion, if we all said, if I can make the world different than the way that I had to do it and make it in a better way and solve that solution, we will start making the world a better place. 
Um, so yeah, so that's just, that's a weird one. Okay. Uh, the assumption, my parents don't want me prying. I don't know what that means. Cons- conversations about an aging parent's trust, estates, or long-term care needs can be awkward. This is an area where Jin Exer, Margarita Cheng, a financial advisor and CEO of Blue Ocean Global Wealth, says she feels a lot of calls from people her age. The trouble, avoiding tough subjects can matter sometimes more stressful, more expensive, whether a parent eventually has a health issue to fix. One tip Cheng has is to use big life events as an opportunity to discuss difficult planning matters. That is one thing that I have noticed from Jin Shifters and Baby Boomers. I don't know if that's because a lot of the gen, sh- the gen shifters, the gen, gen shifters is a program we have gen generation X. The problem that's something that I've noticed with generation X and with baby, um, uh, boomers is that, um, actually it's from the baby boomers is that they don't like having these in-depth planning conversations about life. And the same thing with, um, the, the I don't know what to generate the world war two people, the world war two generation, my grandparents, And like, I think that we need to have in a society much better conversations about what we're doing in the world. Like it has to, we have to have hard conversations. One, the one that gets me the most is whenever we talk about death, it's like, we all like do we die. It's a hard, I, for some people it could be a hard conversation, but we have to have that conversation at one point in time. We may not be here if we can't create some kind of sentient being or like moving into a robot or something. And even then it's going to be different because it's not going to be our body. We still need to plan and do what happens to our body if we become robots. And so we need to have those conversations. So I encourage you, whoever's listening to this to have those conversations. Think about how you want your life to be into the future. Think about how you want your life to be, your parents' life to be in the future, how their life is going to be when they're dead, when your life is going to be like when you're dead, what's going to be left behind you. Start thinking about that now. It's not going to manifest it into the world. It's going to make a better situation in the future when these things happen because if you don't plan, you plan to fail. It's that same you know, message that people say. That same, I don't know, saying that people say. Um, so uh, use those life events to have good planning sessions. Um, I should own a home is an assumption. I Buying a home is tough right now. I'm going to read that one. All right, baby boomers. Let's see what their assumptions are. I'll pay off the house before retirement. I think everybody should pay off their house. I don't know what, I don't know. The assumption is I'll pay off the house before retirement. Let's see what they have to say. The goal of eliminating a house payment before ending work is a good one, but those who pursue it too aggressively may give up a perk from the previous economic cycle. Yeah, that's probably true. Uh, the trouble mortgage rates were at historic lows for years, at one point reaching the 2% rate, using cash to eliminate that cheap debt completely might feel good, but it could be earning higher returns in the market or even a higher yield. Say, as long as you're outperforming your yields, and traditionally in finance theory, you do what you agree to pay with it and the extra cash you do something else with it can beat out those returns. So, I mean, I guess that's fine. I just, I have a different outlook on how homes, like I want my homes because there's something for children and other children, because the most difficult thing in the world, in my opinion, is housing. And so if families can work together to make sure all the people inside of their family have houses and there is no expectation and there is no greed and there's compassion we can probably a family can work together to make sure that all of the family has houses and i don't see a problem with that and i will never i unless and again I, there might be some bad things but sometimes you don't have to turn like people don't have to take advantage of you like it's okay to be like hey look you took advantage of me i'm not going to do this anymore for you but if we all work together we can all create amazing things together i swear i promise i promise Oh, here's a good assumption because I kind of 100 minus my age should go to equities. I think that they should go to riskier equities. But okay, a longstanding asset allocation tip for the people has been to take 100, subtract their age from it, and invest that percentage into equities and the other amount in conservative assets like bonds. Yes, kind of. I do something different. I'll explain in a second. We're living longer and things are getting more expensive. Many planners now think boomer retirees may need more stock in their portfolio. Yeah, because things are getting horrible in the economy and they need to have more stock in their portfolio. The fix, Struthers generally estimates investors should uh, should up that 100 to about 130. I try to do 120. Um, actually, what I really try to do, well, Struthers generally estimates investors should 
up that 100 to about 130, which would increase the amount of stock in a portfolio and hopefully result in higher return income. The problem is it depends on when you get in, when you're doing that, when there's going to be crashes and there's no guarantee. That is one of the reasons why Index Universal Life Insurance, when it comes to this type of planning for your retirement, works a lot better because of the fact that it stays with the index. And if it goes down, it has a bottom. So you can't lose your actual principal in it. And that's why it's called wealth protection. Now, does it make sense for the amount of insurance that you get? Maybe not. It might, it will probably be less just to get term insurance and just to get life insurance for it. But the thing is, is that there's that bottom. So if we think that we should be putting our money into the S and P 500 anyways, and that is regular diverse portfolio theory, put it in the index, get the life insurance associated with it, which is going to be less life insurance than if you just bought life insurance. But the thing is, is that then you won't get caught in those weird areas where it goes down because you will sit at zero. And then when it picks back up, you will get the returns. And then the other benefit is you can borrow against it, not pay any taxes on the capital gains in it. And then that's just a benefit. Like it should be a conversation that we are having. We need to stop having these conversations where this isn't good. This is better. We have to start having conversations saying what's going to work for you. What's going to make sense for you. And let's get these people to the thing. We don't need to fight over our theories on what's going to be best. All that matters is what's going to be best for the client. And that may not be what's best or what you think is best if it ends up working out for the client. So inside of this link, there is a link to the link tree and there's a link to the index universal life insurance. If you want to talk to our wealth protection team. And again, it is one option. There are all other kinds of options. But when I am talking about specifically stock portfolio theory and we are doing this, I like to you find out when that person thinks they're going to die. I ask people when their grand when their grandparents died, when their parents died, if they're dead, and then what the, their their parent passed away from specifically, and then what their parent did. And then I come up with an average between the two of them. And I say, okay, 90, 95, 100, 110, whatever, right? And so what we'll do from that is then we'll take that and we'll put it into um, riskier things and then less riskier things. But it doesn't necessarily mean that those less riskier things have to be bonds. It could be that those less riskier things are putting things in riskier stocks, and then you're putting things in more consumer staple stocks, and you are lowering that risk, but still being in the stock market, and you will still get better returns than if you had all of that in freaking bonds, or in other words, in debt instruments. And so there are lots of ways to go about that. And so you should always have a good financial advisor. Um, if you're side of, inside of our 3T Warrior Academy, you can hit me up if you have questions about this, or you guys can Snapchat me. We can talk. Um, you can DM me on Instagram, do whatever. We can have more conversations about this because we need to have better planning for us to into retirement where we are not just still in retirement living meagerly. We should be living good, living some type of life that we want to live, waiting to die. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the age of Jeremy. Hopefully you heard some amazing advertisements, but I'm going to give you one more advertisement. Before we start this, make sure to go over to MerlinCrypto.com. It is the smartest way, the smartest way, not the smallest way, the smartest way to track your crypto. Merlin allows you to aggregate all of your crypto coins into one place. And no, I'm not sponsored by Merlin. I own it. It is an app that we have been working on for many, many years. It lets you aggregate all your cryptocurrencies into one place from wallets, from exchanges. So you can see your daily gains and losses. You can see your average price paid because that's how it calculates the gains and losses. You can create exit strategies so you can know when to get out of the market, take some profit, so that you are not left where you started because cryptocurrencies will go up, they will go down. And if you have a plan in place, an exit strategy plan in place, then you can take advantage of those profits. And our Merlin app is just at the beginning. So head on over to MerlinCrypto.com, sign up for a 30 day free trial. Yes, you have to put your credit card in. It is okay. If you don't like the app, which I doubt that you will not like the app. You're going to go up to the profile section. You're going to profile. You're going to go to plan. You're going to go to cancel and bad, bam, that is canceled. You don't have to worry about getting charged. You get 30 days for free with Merlin, the smartest way to track your crypto. And if you're in the three, T warrior Academy, you can get an even bigger discount. Cause when you're part of the three, T warrior Academy, you get a 25% discount on Merlin. Again, there's a monthly fee to it. Yes, you have to put your credit card. It's going to be okay because you are going to love it. 
check out the link in the bio or go to merlincrypto.com because I don't remember if I have the link in the bio and it's really late at night. I might forget to put the link in the bio. So that being said, go to merlincrypto.com, get your 30 day free trial to Merlin, the smartest way to track crypto. No, we're not. We're not a crypto wallet. No, we are not a crypto exchange. We connect to your wallets. We connect to your chains. We do not hold them. We bring them in so you can see all of the magic that Merlin can do because it is the smartest way to track your crypto. All right, let's talk about entrepreneurship. Okay. So I've been thinking over the last weekend, I was like, what am I going to do this podcast on? Um, and then I thought about something that I wanted to do the podcast on. And then I thought about something else I want to do the podcast on. And then I was like, oh my God, I need to make some lo-fi podcasts as well about culture and art and all the cool stuff that is going on inside of my life. It's outside of business, but inside of our free tour Academy, I do a business group and that business group kind of has not had some great new material. Now I was teaching about marketing principles. I was doing presentations on marketing. I have an amazing textbook that I love for marketing. I turned that into PowerPoints and I teach it to people when they're part of the 3T Warrior Academy. If you want to learn about 3T Warrior Academy, that is in the episode description as well, because apparently we just sell all kinds of stuff to people when they're listening to our content now. And so, the point is, is that when I'm in there, we have a book club and then we have like business stuff. And I'm thinking one, yes, it's hard to get people to drum up about their business, but it's not so much that people need the business group for the business. I'm thinking it's more along the lines of that. They don't want, and I could be wrong, but I was thinking about this. It seems to me that the people that are in the, the academy, they want to know what to do to start a business, to find the inspiration or the innovative thing that's going to be the business that they want to do, that's going to make them some kind of living, going to make them extra money. And so the problem is, is that because I'm educated in finance and accounting and business management, I can teach them all kinds about business stuff. But what I don't teach them is how do you innovate? Because not only am I learning more about innovation and learning more about design and learning more about engineering, um, I don't, I don't have never really thought about like how you actually do those things to be better at. I have all kinds of ideas. I'm making those ideas and that's why I'm getting more into innovating um, or inventing and engineering so that I can bring a lot of the stuff that's inside of my, you know, my head to life. And the more that we meditate on Kundalini and the more that we do, um, we, we do breath exercises and we do sexual transmission exercises. Um, and we focus on that, the more creative we're going to be because all of that energy is going to be utilized for creativity, right? We're going to get more to Godhead. We're going to have ideas that maybe people can't conceptualize yet. We're going to have so much energy and creativity to do these things. And so I was thinking like, what do you do? Like, what do they teach in entrepreneurship school? Because there are de degrees such as, um, I don't know if, um, excuse me, I don't know if Arizona State has it. I know University of Arizona has it. Go Sun Devils, go Wildcats. Um, I was a Sun Devil, but still go Wildcats because Arizona is the greatest state. And so, or at least it's a state that I like because of the weather. And so when I am thinking of like, when I was thinking about that, like, what do they teach in the entrepreneur school? Like, that's the stuff that the people need to be taught inside of the 3-2-R Academy. And I want to make the 3-2-R Academy the best place for people to hang out. Not only do I want that to be the best place for people to hang out, I want to be the best place for people to hang out in the business group inside of the 3-2-R Academy. And so our 3-2-R Academy, you know, it's, it's a it's a subscription payment for... Um, it's a subscription payment. Um, if you want to know the price, go to 3-2-R-Academy.com or 3-2-Warrior.com. But you pay and you get access to our mighty networks inside of mighty networks. It's like a social media community platform. We have all kinds of courses. We have all kinds of content. We have all kinds of stuff in there. And so being the businessy person, you know, because of the business degrees is that I talk and teach in the business group. But a lot of the times it's like, okay, so how do you drum up content inside this business group? How do I get better at getting people to have communication in the business group about stuff? How do I get better at, you know, all kinds of things in the business group itself? And so that's one of the things that I want to, I want to learn. I want to know what you would teach to someone to get them innovating so that they can become an entrepreneur because that's what they want to do. But maybe they don't know how to start. Maybe they don't know how to solve a problem. Maybe they don't know stuff because they just, people don't know what they don't know and you need to teach them so that they can know. And then they might be able to do amazing fucking things. And that's why education is so important. And as education is one of my main principles for the things that we invest in and the things that we do and the time that I spend my energy into, that's something I want to know. I want to learn about that. I want to be better at that. 
And so I was thinking, so I did some, you know, binging co-pilot AI stuff, which led me to some great AI stuff that I want to talk about on another podcast probably next week. So make sure that you subscribe to this podcast so you get access to that. And so one of the things, so I looked it up and I said, okay, what are some of the things that they teach? What are some of the things they do? What are the things that you can do to become more innovative to solve problems? And some of these things, oh, I, I read them like, well, duh, this makes perfect sense. But the first one, the first one, I'm like, okay, how do you do, what do, where do you go to do that? So the first one that they said is that, is that that came back was attend innovation workshops. Attending innovation workshops can help entrepreneurs learn new skills and techniques to innovate. So then I was like, okay, let's go and look at some innovative workshops. And I went and tried to Google this and I literally found nothing of it. I found, no, I, I found this. I found a LinkedIn articles. I found uh, college articles. I found like Stanford articles about how you can have an innovation workshop, but not like, innovation workshops themselves. So what I would say for that one specifically, go type in how to hold an innovation workshop and you will get a plethora of resources on what you can do with yourself, if you don't have a team, to try to innovate stuff. Because the thing is, the first thing about it is, is that either you're going to know what you want to do as an entrepreneur, or you're going to want to see, I want to solve a problem so that I can make great amounts of wealth. And that's okay. I don't, there's no, there's no judgment here on the reason of why you're doing something. Or you can be like, okay, well, these are the things that I like. What are things that could be better in this area? Or what can I bring to the table that's new and different than what's currently there? And that can be what I separate myself as. And that's what I can go to market with. So well, the point of what I'm trying to get at with the workshop is you have to actively do stuff in some capacity to get those creative juices flowing, okay? And so the more that you can get those creative juices flowing, the more that you're going to be able to innovate with stuff and the more that you set specific time to go over and think about that stuff, right? Then you will start getting better and more and more ideas. And so like one of the things that I was looking at right before I started recording this, while I was waiting for something to load was I started looking, okay, well, how, what, like, what would you do to be an inventor? Now I didn't follow up with that, but I'm intrigued and I would love to hear from you guys. If you want to, if you are an inventor, like some of the things that you have learned to be an inventor, like I would love to invent stuff. Okay. And so I invent stuff now, like they are, but I would love to invent other stuff. So how can I get better at, at thinking so that I can invent other stuff? That's what I want to know from inventors. Um, and I think that's beneficial for entrepreneurs because that is what actually makes us entrepreneurs. I think people think that it's like, it's like, okay, I need to know, I need to go and learn how to make money. Yes. That's part of the, part of the thing, but you can't make money unless you're solving a problem. Okay. And the more that you can get better at solving the problems, the more you're going to spark your entrepreneur desire and the more that you're going to be more dedicated to finding out that solution so that then you can go and make the wealth from it. Or you can just focus on creating the solution and the wealth will follow usually. Okay, so attend innovation workshops. So go research that. Now, the next one I really like, I love to keep a journal, okay? And that sounds so stupid and so normal social media like, what's your routine in the morning? I get up and I journal for 30 minutes and I write about all the things that I'm grateful for, which you should do. I'm super, uh, gratitude journals are amazing and we recommend that you do gratitude journals. But for the purpose of this, I'm making fun of like the ridiculous morning routines. And then I walk for 90 minutes and then I take time with my wife and then I spend time meditating for three hours. And then I do some yoga and uh, this has all happened in like six hours and I've been up, you know, for like nine hours or whatever by this time. And it's only, you know, six o'clock. And some people do that. A lot of people do that. I am not one of those people that do that. And I'm super, 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 successful. Um, but I think that those things are beneficial and you should have them in your day. But the point is, is that usually in most of those morning routines, there is something about a journal and the journal is super, super beneficial and super, super important. So keeping a journal specifically for writing down new ideas for products or business processes can help entrepreneurs keep track of their ideas and revisit them later. That is 100% one of the ones that I would love to do more of is that every time I have a thought or a process change or a thinking, getting it somewhere and then getting organized in you know, Microsoft OneNote or some other journal, like, I don't know, online, I don't know what Apple has. Google has like keep, 
But OneNote is just so amazing once you learn it, in my opinion. Or Notion. Notion would be another one. We use Notion. I'm not a big, huge fan of Notion. I'm more of a fan of... I take that back. I'm a huge fan of a lot of the things that Notion does. How we use it for our meetings, I'm not a fan of. I would rather just use Word or OneNote. But um, Christopher... This guy named Chris, I'm not going to say his last name, this guy named Chris who helps uh, who helps us with the front end design for um, one of our apps, wink, wink, one of our apps, he, has, he does amazing stuff with Notion and so I'm not going to bash it because you can do a lot of cool stuff with it, like our bug reporting system that we have in it's freaking amazing. Okay, so keep a journal, keeping a journal specifically for writing down new ideas for products or business processes can help entrepreneurs keep track of their ideas and revisit them later. So have a journal spend some time every i mean an idea maybe get one of those cool hey, i'm gonna go buy one right after this i'm gonna get one of those those like memo flip notes and then once i have an idea i'm gonna be like oh my god this would be amazing as an app this is how we're going to distribute this this is because i had like four or five ideas earlier and i don't want to forget them because they were amazing and so i'm gonna write them down okay i'm not going to tell them to you because i don't want you to steal them all right network networking we talked about last week i think it was last week networking with other entrepreneurs can help entrepreneurs learn from their experiences and get feedback on their ideas i think that's great share your ideas don't share everything about your idea but most people you can share your idea for because they're focusing on their ideas and no longer steal your ideas but just be mindful of that um asking questions is a big one asking questions such as how can i make this product or experience better that's the, what has led me to making the age of radio app um and the things that I'm doing with it, like I'm looking at it, I'm asking, you know, people questions like, where would you think this, what would make this easier? What would make this better? What can we innovate in? What can, what can we, what do I know that could be completely different than what's already out there that will make a big impact for this? Because this is the thing that there we're missing in all of them. Right. And it's because if you ask the people for it, they may not see it. Um, in that, uh, 10 faces of innovation book, there's a fantastic quote. They were helping some, the, the company, um, 10 faces, 10, 10 faces of innovation, 10 profiles of in, 10 faces of innovation. I really wish I had the book next to me. Okay. And so they're helping with the Mayo Clinic, I think it is. And up on the Mayo Clinic wall, it says, is a quote from Ford, you know, the Ford Motor Guy. He says, if I asked customers what they wanted, they would have told me a faster horse. And so the thing is, is that there is sometimes innovation outside because sometimes people don't know what they want, right? Or yes, we want a faster horse. They don't know how to conceive of the thing that is the faster of the horse, right? So, okay, well, we can't get a horse to go this fast, but we could build a truck or we could build a Model T car. We could have the crank engine. I don't know how Model Ts work. Okay, and maybe I don't even know how cars work. Okay, because I crank my car. I'm just kidding. Okay, so um, so ask uh, so ask questions. Like, look at what it is that you want to change. All of the inventions that I have had or the ideas that I've had, I am like, ah, this is just sucks. Like, this is stupid. And all of you suck at it because no one's willing to take the time to make it better because, and again, I, I'm not going to judge anybody who's just going after wealth because most of the time it's just after wealth. It's not to make the thing better. If you focus on making the thing that you want to make better and better and better and better, you will be the winner in the end. It, again, there's lots of things that I don't agree with Elon Musk, but he is trying to make things better. And that's why he has so much money. He wasn't after money. He just continuously tried to make things better. Now, did he create all of them himself? And was there some, you know, did he push some people out of Tesla? And like, is he really running SpaceX? I mean, he is running SpaceX, but is he really, he's probably doing a lot of the design. I shouldn't do that. He's probably, he's probably a really good designer. Um, and he's definitely a great industrial designer. Um, anyway. Okay. So be open to new ideas. I feel like that's ridiculous because that would be the main thing that you would have to be open for if you were innovating stuff and to create your innovation flowing. The last one that they say here is take calculated risks. I don't think entrepreneurs should take entrepreneurs should just take some risks on the thing that's going to be the best thing possible. That's my personal opinion. Okay. So all of these aside, attend innovation workshops, keeping a journal, networking, asking questions. Oh, research industry trends is a really good one because like if you look right now, like you could say, okay, so what's a big industry trend that's happening right now is artificial intelligence. So all of you should be involved with artificial intelligence in some capacity, in some way, learning about it right now, because at the beginning of the trends is when you're going to see all of the problems on the things that all the other people didn't see. So if you start looking at those things, you say, okay, this is how we can make this better. This is what I want to do. Yada, yada, yada. Let's go innovate. Let's go create. It's kind of like what we did with Merlin or what my good Johnny COVID with a K said with Merlin. That's Johnny Crypto on the Good Morning Crypto Show. No one calls him Johnny COVID. 
Abdullah said that and it was really funny and now I keep saying it, but I hope that we do not manifest COVID for him because that is not our intention by me saying that. Okay. The other thing that I would say, I would say try to be involved with as much creative activity as possible because I think that most of my energy flows for business ideas when I'm playing music or when I am doing graphic design or when I'm trying to learn how to do, you know, Adobe Illustrator. I don't know how to draw, so I didn't say draw, but if I was drawing when I try to draw, that that all of those things create your juices, creative writing, right? All of those arts and humanities, people say that the arts and humanities degrees are like ridiculous. No, they're not. One, we need arts and humanities degrees because we need people to study and research and know about arts and humanities because that's what culture is created from for the most part. And when you're practicing a lot of those things, whether you're good at it or not, that gets those creative things flowing. You also get into steady state thinking. Like if I'm just sitting here playing a song or I'm writing a song or I'm just playing a music, playing music, or I'm just doing some journaling or I'm doing some creative um, um, pottery making, you get stuck in these areas where you're like subconscious is kind of thinking while you're thinking about the thing that you're doing. And then you come up with new ideas and that's how those things get sparked. Um, or if you're just, or like, if you're so good at that, or if you're just doing it in a mundane way, you can spark all of these new ideas from it. And so that's one of the reasons why most of us have a creative outlet that we have, but we've been, we've been learned to suppress it because of stupid fucks on the internet that are like, why would I get an arts and humanities degree? Why would I get a liberal degree? I don't know why they sound like that specifically, but that's what they usually sound like. And that's not the point. What I'm saying is like, we, sh we need the arts and the culture and we need the acting and the creative writing and the, 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 um, humanities. And we need to understand religions and talk about philosophy and logic. And those are the things that create the world. Right. Um, and they're the things that innovate us the most and inspire us the most. And when we involve ourselves in them, we can really learn to spark that entrepreneur desire and that innovation. So this is a journey that I'm going to go on. I already started looking at textbooks for entrepreneurship because I want to know like what it is. Cause like it's not marketing and it's not finance and it's not management that make up an entrepreneur. Those are like, those are like, those are like, um, disciplines that are within inside of this thing that causes people to create Entre entrepreneurship is really more invention it's really more innovation that's really what's at the heart of entrepreneurship any asshole that starts a business we call them entrepreneurs but if they really didn't innovate or create something new I'm willing, I think that that's, I don't think that that's an entrepreneur. I think we use that term too broadly. I think it's just a small business owner. If a guy goes out and buys a fucking Jimmy John's franchise, he's not an entrepreneur. He's a small business owner, right? I, I, I think an entrepreneur in my mind and in my heart, I feel like we need a better definition. I, I know that the definition is kind of like a small business owner, right? But like we need a definition of someone who goes and solves a problem for something and then they make a profit off <laughs> that problem, I guess, or that solution. But I don't know. That's just my thoughts. I, I really think that you should go and learn more about entrepreneurship. I'm going to start looking at it because I want to teach that in our three, two, our Academy. I want to, I want to take those learnings. I want to package them up and I want to see if I can spark some new businesses being made and new ideas being created from our business group. That's really what I want it to be. I want it to be like IDEO, which is like, an organization that I know absolutely shit about, except for this book that I'm reading from on their organization. Um, and, and that's what I want. That's what I want my legacy to be inside of three, two or Academy. I want as many people as possible to come into three, two Academy, learn from me in the business group and walk away with innovation and ideas. So with that being said, I always say, Namo Amina Butsu, be thankful, grateful, and kind, and we will talk with you next time. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to The Age of Jeremy. Make sure that you like and subscribe to this podcast. If your podcatcher allows you to, please rate and review this podcast so we can get in front of more people. 
Um, the beginning song was Brave Bases Everyone by Spanish Love Songs. The closing song was Threatening Each Other Recapitalism by Illuminati Hotties. I love to use Neumann microphones and I'm using a Neumann microphone. Zoom L8 is what I record into. I use Steinberg's Cubase is what I record with and I use Waves plugins. One last time, remember, be thankful, grateful, and kind. We will talk with you next time. Bye.